The polar bear, or ice or sea bear, are one of the largest land predators in the world. They're found in really cold places like Alaska, Russia, Canada or Norway. These guys are huge. An adult can go up to 2.5 metres long and weigh as much as 650 kilos. When these guys are born, they're super cute. They're about the size of a dog and just as playful. And I'm off to meet somebody whose job it is to look after them. I'm here at SeaWorld with Matt, who's a polar bear keeper. Hi Matt, how long have you been working with Hudson? He's huge. He's a big boy. Been with him for about eight years now. Solid eight years, wow, yeah. what a privilege. Yeah, it's a very awesome job. So what's the hardest thing about working with an animal this big? They're completely protected contact, so we can't go in with them, which means that we have to have a very good understanding and relationship with them in order to get them to come in and out of dens and to look after their husbandry. How much would a big guy like Hudson eat in a day? He could eat as little as one kilo, or the most he's ever eaten is 40 kilos a day. Wow, that's a lot of food. So how do you communicate with him? So basically, if Hudson doesn't want to do something, then he's not going to do it. <laughs> and so we have to use our rapport that we build with the animals in order to set them up to succeed and get that positive outcome for a behaviour. Tell me about Hudson's personality. Hudson is extremely playful. Like, if you give him a toy out on exhibit, he'll play with it for hours. What kind of toys do polar bears play with? Big ones. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier this year, Hudson fathered baby polar bear Mishka with fellow SeaWorld resident Rhea. So you've been working with Hudson now for over eight years. When did the baby come along? Mishka was born on the 26th of April at around 2 o'clock in the morning. And when she was born, she was only about 500 grams. Wow. So really, really small, about the size of a guinea pig. What does she weigh now? Uh, at the moment, she's weighing 20 kilos. So she's just over four months old and she's put on 19 and a half kilos, which is pretty quick. And are they all the same or do they all have different personalities? Each one of them is totally different and a lot of time people will say, well, who's your favourite? And I, there's just no such thing as a favourite with these guys. So I've read that polar bear skin is actually black. Is that right? They're totally black. If you took all of their hair off of them, they would be completely black. So they're covered in a transparent hair and it's actually hollow as well. So when sunlight reflects off of it, it reflects the colour that they're around. So if they're around ice, they'd look nice and white. So how do these guys hunt in the wild? Polar bears are known as the silent hunter. So they've got a lot of adaptions that allow them to catch seals, which is their main source of protein out in the wild. And they've also got an extremely massive sense of smell. They have one third of their brain devoted to that sensory organ. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's massive. So they can smell roughly about 30 kilometers, straight line, no hills or anything like that. And whenever we come up to do a training session, he normally assesses what food we've got before he decides if he wants to come and partake in it. Thanks so much for today, Matt. But while I'm here, is there any chance I can have a cuddle with Mishka? It's my pleasure, but there is absolutely no way. Oh, I finally got my cuddle. This one's a little tamer than Mishka, though. Hello. Hello. Oh. Dry ice has to be one of the weirdest and most amazing substances I've ever come across. One of my many jobs is working as a stylist and prop maker in TV and film, and we use dry ice to create a spooky look. It's almost like little fog creatures are spilling out coming to get you. Well, today I'm going to try and capture this sinister cloud in a bubble. So what you'll need for that is a big round tub with a thick lip, some dry ice, gloves and goggles, water, soapy water and an old cut-up T-shirt. Public service announcement. Dry ice can burn you. So this is not an experiment you can do on your own. Have an adult to help you. This is dry ice or frozen carbon dioxide. And when it's in its solid form, it is so cold. So cold it can burn you. Ouch. Unlike other substances that start off as a solid, can be melted into a liquid and then heated further into a gas, dry ice goes directly from a solid straight to a gas. OK, that's all we need. And this is called...
Sublimation. Sublimation. When you add water to dry ice, it speeds up the sublimation process. It causes it to turn into gas very quickly. And that's how you get this smoky effect. OK, let's catch this cloud. Now, the first step is to put on your safety equipment. Always put your goggles and gloves on. Oh! Yes! That was dumb, dumb. I want to use that. OK. Take two. Then add dry ice to your tub. I'm tipping mine in, but don't ever touch it with your hands. Use tongs. And add some water. OK, got to work quickly. Soak your T-shirt in the soapy water and run it around the edge. Now open up your T-shirt along, stretch the T-shirt flat across the bowl and glide it towards you. Remember, we're making a bubble. <gasps> it did. Oh my gosh, it's rising. The gas is filling the bubble. Is it going to pop? <laughs> that was awesome. That bubble is huge. Let's try it again. Now the swish around. So what's happening here? The thin film of detergent creates a seal on the top of the bowl, but the dry ice is still bubbling away underneath. And more and more of the dry ice is converting into smoky gas. And it's trapped. And just like a balloon, if you continue to blow air into it, the more and more it gets stretched, the thinner and thinner it gets until it pops. <sighs> Whoa, let's do it a third time. I'm addicted. I love science. I'm Rod Stoller and I'm an ice technician for skating at festivals around Australia. A normal day for the ice rink involves coming down, checking that the refrigeration plant is, uh, is in good order and making sure that the ice is in good condition. What I'm looking for is for the ice to be smooth and dry. So when we open for all the public, they'll have a great time. To build an outdoor ice rink, we need a completely level surface and we lay down um, up to 10 kilometres of aluminium piping with big pipes at either end so that we can pump glycol, which is like antifreeze, which lowers the freezing point of water below zero. This is a model of what you find underneath the ice rink. We have a big pipe which delivers the glycol, which is mixed with water, into the floor. It then runs down through 10 kilometres of aluminium pipes over the whole expanse of the rink into what we call a subheader. It then returns back into this other big pipe and goes back to the refrigeration plant. That then continually flows around through the system and is pumped back into the ice floor to keep the water frozen as ice so you can skate on it. To build an ice rink from scratch takes between three and four days. Once you've put down the, uh, all the piping, uh, and done the initial flood, it then takes another couple of days to layer the, uh, the ice to the right thickness. You could skate easily on about five millimetres of ice, providing it's on a very solid surface. But because we're using aluminium pipes, we need to make sure that we have cover over the top of the aluminium pipes. As people are skating on the ice, it wears the surface away. So what we do is we just get the garden hose out and give it a very light misting of water, and that then freezes as soon as it touches the ice enables us to keep the level up so that it's safe for skating. Well, I actually started off in event management and uh, doing winter festivals, but we needed to learn how to make ice rinks. One of the best parts of the job is that we get to travel overseas doing research into the best ways to make ice and keep up with the, the latest technologies and the developments. 
Every ice rink is completely different, whether it's an indoor rink or an outdoor rink, and there are factors which affect the way you have to build the ice. So you need to understand how the ice is being made and what the key factors are for it so that you can adjust what you're doing for each and every rink to get the best possible ice. So we've built this rink here, which is in the middle of Sydney as part of the skating at festivals around Australia. But being an outdoor rink, we can have lots of problems with the weather. Uh, if it rains, obviously the, uh, the surface will get wet. Also wind, the friction of that rubbing against the ice will melt the ice and make it wet. And of course, when the sun comes out, it will melt it a bit. Now you can still skate while it's wet, no problems at all, but it's not very pleasant if you fall over. The warmest place we've ever built an ice rink was in Alice Springs in the summer. And uh, fortunately, we were building that indoors in air-conditioned comfort, but outside the refrigeration was in 48 degrees temperature, so it had to work very hard to make the ice. To melt the ice on the ice rink, we have two ways of doing it. We sometimes put a heater in, and so instead of making the glycol cold, we warm it, and that, of course, melts the ice. Uh, and the other way is just to wait till the sun gets on it and the temperature and it melts naturally, which takes a few days. Once the ice is melted, we recycle all the water back into the uh, ecosystems, so the rivers and streams. I wasn't always good at science at school, but uh, I'm glad I stuck with it and did the best I could because what I learned there has helped me enormously now that I've become a, an ice technician. The coolest part of the job is actually freezing the ice and then seeing people get on it and have a really good time. No, I'm not a good ice skater, but you don't have to be a good ice skater to make good ice rinks or to have a whole lot of fun. Ice is also found on other planets and moons. Jupiter has over 50 moons, and one of these, Europa, is covered in a thick shell of ice. Underneath that ice is thought to be a vast ocean, possibly full of life. Hmm, Europa aliens. I wonder what they look like. Breaking news coming out of the solar system. One of the planets is looking blue and cold. Josh Richards is on the scene. Josh? Hi, Josh. And may I just say, you're doing a stellar job at presenting the news this morning. Why, thank you, reporter Josh. It's always nice to hear from a fan. How's it going there? It's all looking very lively. Lively is one way of putting it. I've made it to the planet furthest from the sun. And it's windy. It's really windy. Like, five times stronger than even the most powerful winds on Earth. It's also cold. Like, really, really cold. Minus 270 degrees. So, I've got all my snow gear on, but it's still pretty chilly. Now, a hefty breeze isn't the only thing happening on Neptune. That weird blue colour, that's not abnormal. That's the colour that Neptune actually is. The methane in the upper atmosphere absorbs the red light from the sun, but it reflects the blue light back out into space. Neptune is nearly 4.5 billion kilometres from the sun, which explains its cool nature. Time moves a little bit slowly here on Neptune as well. One Neptunian year is nearly 165 Earth years. Gives me plenty of time to work on those New Year's resolutions. <laughs> I am looking forward to the night, though, because Neptune has 13 moons. They're all named after gods in Greek mythology. Lucky I didn't name them because they just would have been moon 1 to 13. Neptune can't support life as we know it, so I'm going to take my cue to leave this egg-shaped planet behind. The usual journey takes about 12 years, but I'm hoping if I'm fast, I can get the express rocket home. Bye! Good stuff, Josh, and that concludes the weather for tonight. I hope your evening is out of this world. <laughs> Several ice ages have happened in Earth's history. Imagine standing on this beach 20,000 years ago and seeing land, maybe even desert, for miles in front of you. Glaciers and ice sheets used to cover a lot more of the Earth's surface. During the last ice age, Sydney Harbour had no water in it at all. It was all frozen, locked up in a glacier. Imagine walking through Sydney Harbour with no water in it. That would be crazy. I'm in Canberra on a bitterly cold morning, standing in a field covered in frost. Now, for frost to form, the temperature has to fall below the point of freezing, which is zero degrees. And it certainly got below zero last night. It was minus seven degrees Celsius. 
There are sheets of white ice crystals everywhere. It was on a car windscreen this morning, and we had to scrape it off before we drove here. It's on the blades of grass, the dirt, pretty much anything that's left out in the open. It is a beautiful sunny day here. The sun is heating up, and as you can see, the frost is already starting to melt. In an hour or so, it'll all be gone. from the tap clear, but ice from the freezer is white and cloudy in the middle. A friend of mine told me that if you want the perfect ice cube without any cloudy middle, you should boil the water first and then freeze it. So if you want to try this too, you're going to need two ice cube trays, a marker pen, some tap water, a kettle to boil some water, a freezer and an adult to help you. OK, it's time to get experimental with my ice cubes. We're going to try freezing some different kinds of water. First, we're going to start with tap water. So now I'm going to get my marker pen and write tap water on the tray. So now that the water has boiled, we're going to pour the boiling water into our other ice cube tray. Remember, if you are going to try this, always have an adult boil the water for you and pour it. Never carry boiling water on your own. So now I've got to write boiled on my other ice cube tray. OK, now it's time to put these guys in the freezer. Luckily, I've got some here that I prepared earlier. Wow. Well, this ice cube is really grey and fuzzy with lots of bubbles inside it. And this one, not so much. Now, this one came from my tap at home, which mixes lots of air into the water as it's coming out the tap. And you can see the air bubbles trapped inside the ice. This ice cube came from the boiled water, and I managed to boil most of the air out of the water. So there's only a little bit left. The reason why it's cloudy in the middle is because the middle of the ice cube is the last part to freeze up and all of the gas and air gets trapped in the middle. So the reason why this one is clearer is because when I heated the water, the air rose up and left the water. When I froze it, there was less air trapped inside. Even though there is the cloudy centre, I think I'd rather have this ice cube in my drink. So my ice cubes aren't perfect. So why don't you try and see how many times you need to boil your water to get all of the air out and make a perfect crystal clear ice cube. 